Good evening. I'm Dr. Susan Shaw, the founder and director of the Shaw Institute based in Maine, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our 2020 environmental webinar series, Planet in Crisis, Science and Survival. Today, Americans are well aware of the importance of science, of public health in our lives. We designed this webinar series to bring to you the voices of leading scientists tackling the greatest challenges of our time. Climate change, plastic pollution, ocean pollution, toxic human exposures, and the global COVID pandemic. This evening's speaker is Paul Andrew Majewski, polar explorer, acclaimed climate scientist, and my friend and colleague. Dr. Majewski's talk tonight will look at the first abrupt climate change in the modern era the extreme challenges that we face, and exciting opportunities on the horizon. Paul Majewski is the director of the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine and distinguished professor in the schools of Earth and Climate Sciences, Marine Sciences, Policy and International Affairs, and the Business and Law Schools. He has led more than 60 expeditions to remote polar reaches of the planet and is the first person to develop and lead major climate research programs at the three poles, the third pole being Everest, of course. Dr. Majewski is the author of over 450 scientific publications and two books, Journey into Climate and Ice Chronicles. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the first International Medal for Excellence in Antarctic Research, and the Explorers Club prestigious Lowell Thomas Award. And now, Dr. Paul Andrew Majewski. Okay, I think we're live now. Uh, thank you, Susan, uh, for the introduction. And thank you, Susan, and your colleagues at the Shaw Institute uh, for everything that you do for the Blue Hill Peninsula and for science. Uh, your activities in, in monitoring outreach and advocacy are greatly appreciated by all of us on the peninsula and a much, much larger, larger audience uh, throughout the world. So thank you. And thank you all of, the, all of you out there, no doubt comfortably sitting in your sofas, probably with a beer. So I'm a little bit jealous. Uh, I just have a, a glass of water here. I'd also like to thank my wife. Uh, my wife has allowed me to uh, not just allowed, she's helped me to follow my dreams, and I, I hope that I've done the same thing for her. And I mention my dreams in particular because my entire life, even as a young child, I always wanted to go to remote places. I wanted to visit cultures that other people didn't necessarily get to uh, easily. I wanted to experience new things physically, mentally, by being in extreme areas. Uh, and. As a consequence, I went to college and to graduate school to study sciences because I thought that that would be the best way to follow my dream. Uh, it turned out uh, to work quite well, and I'm still doing it. Uh, but to me, the interesting thing was that I really didn't consider myself to be a scientist until about 10 years after I finished graduate school and was already at university teaching. Uh, now, why would that be? I was under the impression in those days, as most of us were, that there were many, much of the, many of the questions we wanted to ask about the world were really solved. We believed that the climate changed very slowly. We assumed that uh, our air quality was fairly good. Uh, we assumed, most importantly, that things just didn't change that much. And that what we had experienced in our childhood or what our parents experienced was in fact what we would experience in the future. We know that that's definitely not the case. Uh, and in particular, I'll focus how, on how this is not the case in terms of climate itself. So um, even in the last two years, uh, I've led more than 60 expeditions all over the world. And over the last two years, we've, uh, my teams and I have, uh, have gone to several different places. And let me just mention briefly where we went what we did, and then show you how this has something to do with Maine, the Arctic, uh, and where we are today. In 2018, uh, we went into the 
Peruvian Andes, collected an ice core, and you'll find out why ice cores, at least very briefly, are important. Mostly interested in the fact that this is a water tower, a place where water is captured in ice and made available in the, in, during the dry season for the people in the area. We went to the Swiss Italian Alps in the last couple of years and several years before that, and there we studied pandemics. Uh, we found a tool in which we could identify uh, the relationship between socioeconomic change and pandemics. Uh, we didn't actually find the viruses, uh, hopefully we won't, uh, but we studied the Black Death and we even studied the uh, 1918 swine flu, Spanish flu, which was H1N1, uh, and that one was quite disastrous. 100 million people uh, perished as a consequence of that. We're nowhere near that and we won't be. What did we learn? Many things, but one of the most important things that we learned uh, was that for the past 2,000 years, lead levels have been increased as a consequence of human activity. We found out about this because when we looked at the Black Death, it's the only time in the last 2,000 years that the levels dropped down to almost zero. Why is this important? It's important because we almost always assumed that natural levels of lead well, it could be found maybe in, in the year 1800, 1750, just before the, the really big industrial revolution. It turns out that we've been emitting lead, which obviously has consequences to our health for a long time. Uh, about a year ago, this time I was coming back from a major expedition. I was approached by National Geographic and Rolex uh, to lead a multi-interdisciplinary expedition to Everest. We had biology. Uh, geology, glaciology, mapping, and meteorology we conducted. We uh, put in the highest, our teams put in the highest automatic weather stations in the world, uh, the highest ice core in the world, explored, in fact, what sort of organisms live at these very high elevations, and a variety of other things. Backing up to the third expedition in the last two years, uh, we the work we did on Everest, why did we go there? We went to Everest to see if the very highest parts of the planet were being impacted by climate change? And the answer is yes. Uh, there are movies out there now about it, and there'll be a large report coming out soon. February, we returned from the Southern Ocean after a couple of months, and we were looking for evidence of pollution in this very remote uh, region with many small islands that are hard to access, which is why uh, we went by sailboat. Uh, and we were also interested in finding out how ecosystems, in particular the penguins in the area, were being impacted. The Southern Ocean is probably the most productive ocean in the world uh, in terms of our food sources and others. So why did we go to these places in the last two years? Why have we done all of these things, all these expeditions to remote areas? T.S. Eliot probably uh, says it best, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Uh, many people have said this and there's a tremendous amount of truth to it. You don't have to go to Mount Everest necessarily to understand what's going at, at home, but we need to look into a much larger uh, venue in order to understand how we're changing, how things around us are changing, and what the impacts are. So this brings us to the title of the talk, The Arctic, Maine, and the First Abrupt Climate Change Event in the Modern Era. The context, of course, for modern climate change is based largely on this dramatic rise in greenhouse gases. We know from ice core records that cover the last 850,000 years that the levels of greenhouse gases have, in the last few decades, risen to 1.5 times higher than they've ever been in the last 850,000 years. And something that I think is equally as important is the fact that the rise has been 100 times faster uh, than it's been in the past. Why ice cores? I'm sure many of you may have heard about ice cores or even heard my, my talks before. This sounds a little bit repetitive, but I'll, uh, I just need to mention it. We get a tremendous perspective from ice cores. It allows us to go back in time and see, in fact, how much change we are experiencing today. That change could be in terms of temperature, precipitation, sea ice extent, biological productivity, a variety of things. And we have the ability to go back, actually, right now, about a million or two million years. Uh, and we can do it in many cases, year by year, and even storm by storm. Uh, so the first big thing we learned by going well outside of our comfort zone uh, was that we could get a record 
in detail year by year that covered the last 110,000 years. And we recovered this record using an ice core from central Greenland. And from this record, we learned that in fact, the thing that I thought and we all thought was one of the overarching principles of natural science, the fact that uh, glaciers and the climate just don't, uh, ch they, that it changed very slowly was not true. We learned that in fact, uh, the climate can change very quickly in a matter of a couple of years. Massive changes in temperature, precipitation, uh, storm frequency, and that this change can be sustained for not just decades, but in some cases for hundreds of years. That was something that we learned back in 1992. It was slow to be accepted as anything that had relevance uh, to modern day. But in order to make that demonstration, we took a look at the relationship between these abrupt changes in climate and changes in civilization. And as it turns out, there are many, many times when this happens. That isn't to say that climate is the cause of all changes in civilization, but it certainly is a very important one. I'll, I'll just pick one event. Uh, 4,200 years ago, if you look at the figure here, you see that it's the biggest drop in this figure, which represents the last 10,000 years. And that drop represents a massive decrease in the sea ice extent uh, in the North Atlantic. Uh, and at that time, uh, during periods of, even now, during the summer, uh, regions in modern day Syria and Iraq, which at that time were the Mesopotamian Empire, those regions experienced drought. And that drought led to the collapse of civilizations in that area. There are other examples which I won't go into, but I will mention for modern day that one of the reasons underpinning uh, the Arab Spring is the fact that regions like Syria and Iraq, the very same regions as the Mesopotamian uh, ancient civilization, those areas have been in drought. And as a consequence, there's been obvious stress uh, and obvious disruption geopolitically to people, uh, millions of refugees as a consequence. Was it only because of climate change? No, but climate change certainly made a very big difference. So we needed to find a way in which we could take a lot of information, uh, in particular about the modern climate, but also about past climate, and be able to see how this information in terms of climate, temperature, precipitation, uh, changes in time, and changes in space. To do that, we developed, in particular my colleague Sean Burkle developed, uh, a software program called Climate Reanalyzer. It's available to the public. Uh, we get about two to 3,000 hits a day. It appears in newspapers and media uh, all over the place. And we can use this tool, uh, and I do, to show you many of the things that we will see in the future. One of the most interesting and one of the first that we looked at is how is global warming proceeding on the planet? And the answer is it's not quite global yet. Uh, if in fact the entire planet were warming evenly, we probably would have in some ways a simpler situation, in other, in other ways a more complicated. But if we look at the reality of how much change has occurred in roughly the last 15 years compared to the previous 25 years, we see that the regions of greatest change in temperature are in the northern hemisphere, a little bit in the southern hemisphere, continental regions, and the coasts of Antarctica. But the biggest change in temperature is actually in the uh, Russian Arctic portion of the Arctic Ocean. If we examine more closely and take a look at, the real, at how much the sea ice extent has changed for, since, for example, 1980 on the left side of the chart versus 2016, we see that at least in the summer, an entire new ocean is emerging. Uh, this is quite amazing. There are not very many people uh, who, in, in our entire history of humans, who have been around during which an entirely new ocean appears on the planet, but we are seeing it. And we expect that that ocean will be more and more ice-free, certainly in the summer and throughout the year as warming continues. Uh, as this warming continues in the Arctic, it raises yet another mechanism, or I should say a tool or prodding factor that will change the temperature dramatically, and that's methane. Methane is trapped in the frozen ground of the Arctic, 
and as the Arctic permafrost begins to warm, it releases methane. Uh, all indications are it's being released faster than anybody thought before. Why is methane important? It was taken into account, has been taken into account in the models thus far, uh, but as we see more and more methane, methane is 30 to 50 times more effective in trapping heat than CO2, and it's CO2 that we've been thinking about uh, primarily. So we are in store for even more change in the coming decades as a consequence of this. Now let's focus in on the recent abrupt climate change that occurred along with this opening of a new Arctic Ocean. If you look at the uh, left-hand side of the figure, you see the red spot over the eastern Arctic. And if you take a look at the, uh, at the significance of that, uh, it, what it's telling you is that between 2007 and 2012, there was about an 8 degree Fahrenheit increase in the mean annual temperature. That is really, really big. And the way to tell that that's really big is from the right side, which tells us basically how much the summer has changed in that region of the Eastern Arctic. In effect, the summer doubled in length as a consequence of that warming. Just imagine doubling the length of the summer in a place like Maine. It would change all of our ecosystems. It would change the way we do things, the way uh, we travel. Uh, to many people, it would, might make it much uh, more appealing. There would probably be even more people living here. Uh, it's a dramatic change. Not necessarily one that stops civilization, but certainly a dramatic change. As the Arctic warms, significantly more than the mid-latitudes, this changes the wind systems, in particular the system that you're looking at here. That red streak that's going across the, the screen is the jet stream, and you can see that the jet stream tends to be, uh, at least in this reconstruction, very wavy, elements of it break off. It becomes wavier and wavier the bigger the difference in the, uh, I, I should say, not the bigger, sorry, the less the difference, the smaller the difference in the temperature between the Arctic and the mid-latitudes, in this case, as a consequence of this dramatic warming in the Arctic, the more and more wavy this jet stream pattern gets. What does that mean? It creates extreme events. It takes uh, cold air uh, and pushes it much farther south, than normal uh, because the cold air is on the north side of the jet stream and it takes warm air and pushes it significantly farther north. Uh, and this particular slide uh, shows you a situation which started in the winter of 2014. If you take a look at the path of the jet stream, it's actually poking its way uh, literally right up the North Atlantic, right into the North Pole. Uh, and if you take a look at the temperature plot on the right-hand side, you find out that in midwinter, complete darkness, the North Pole since 2014 has had a few days uh, during which the temperatures are above freezing. Quite remarkable. Take a look at the other end of the spectrum, the wildfires that occurred uh, in California not too long ago and that, in fact, have been repeating. Why are we having bigger uh, and more persistent uh, more frequent wildfires. Part of it's because of the jet stream. Uh, as the jet stream becomes wavy, makes its way inland uh, just to the east of California, it drags down uh, cold air, but it also drags down dry air. And it's very fast moving dry air. And as soon as you have any sort of ignition in the forests in California, the way to make them even more terrifying uh, is obviously to bring, is to keep them, keep the whole area dry and bring in more oxygen and bring in stronger winds. And if we look at the situation, which we experience every now and then, uh, this particular one's from 2018, but we've experienced the same thing in the, in the winter recently. Uh, you can see that uh, in the reconstruction on the left, this is all using climate reanalyzer. The blue means it's cold. North America, you can tell, tends to, in this particular period, tend to, to be significantly colder uh, than the rest of the northern hemisphere, which is primarily red, and it's because of the shape of the jet stream. This very irregular pattern caused by the fact that the temperature difference between the Arctic and the mid-latitudes is less and less 
causing the jet stream to become wavier. Why are air masses important? Why does it matter what's going on with the jet stream? I gave you a couple of examples, but the quick summary is the jet stream uh, and all atmospheric circulation systems, winds uh, carry heat, they carry moisture, they carry pollutants, and they influence the strength and direction and persistence of ocean currents. They're very powerful. As demonstrated by these cloud patterns uh, moving across, this is a NASA uh, simulation, and if you look at the middle, you see the, uh, an orange stripe coming off Africa and going into uh, the southeastern United States. That's exactly what's happening today. These winds are so strong in this particular case, these are winds that go from east to west, that they're able to carry dusts right across into North America and South America. And they're one of the mechanisms by which dust gets into the Amazon, uh, fertilizing the Amazon for growth. So we also know that atmospheric circulation systems transport pollutants. And without going into a lot of detail, we've been able to demonstrate, along with many other people, that the last 100, 150 years, we have experienced an absolutely unparalleled, this plot only goes back 5,000 years, but I'm going to say unparalleled in Earth history, a combination of chemicals in the atmosphere. The list is here. The obvious one is greenhouse gases, acid rain. We didn't know about this when I started my work. Toxic metals. We didn't understand that lead levels uh, could be so high that they would impact health. And on and on and on, including radioactivity, which uh, we certainly were able to demonstrate uh, from the above ground testing of the nuclear bombs. We've created, this is the, in many ways, the saddest part of the whole story, we've created effect effectively a toxic climate cocktail in which our respiratory health is impacted by particulates in the atmosphere, uh, things like cadmium increase. Uh, neurological diseases, cancers, lead, uh, heart attacks, ecosystem upheaval as a consequence of ocean acidification and warming that brings in vector-borne uh, diseases with the air masses uh, and a variety of other things. Uh, one more sad note, uh, and obviously we live in a very stressful period right now, but it's important to realize uh, what's uh, what's out there in addition to the current situation, turns out one in, in 10 deaths worldwide are a consequence of poor air quality, 7 million premature deaths. So what do we do? We help to d provide perspective about how much, uh, what's going into the atmosphere as a consequence of human activity, how much it's changed. We developed some software called 10 Green, which is also uh, publicly available. And if you take a look at Blue Hill, uh, Blue Hill registers as a five. 10 is the best. Nobody gets a 10 because of greenhouse gases. The reds are not so good, and it suggests from our data, you can see the spread of the data by all of the red dots over the United States, that areas like Blue Hill tend to have probably a slightly higher levels of particulates than we should have which can cause some amount of respiratory disease. The gray for heavy metals uh, means that we really don't have a lot of heavy metal data for this area. So we really don't know that much about lead in the air, cadmium in the, in the air, and a variety of other things. We should, and that's one of the reasons that we put this together. You can go by zip code or name of place and learn a lot about the air quality where you live. Now here's the good news. We've also been able to demonstrate with our ice cores that clean air legislation works. Reductions in sulfate, which was acid, one of the major components of acid rain. Uh, re, uh, reductions in lead in gasoline. These are all super clearly seen in ice cores. So there is no doubt whatsoever that if we have clean air legislation, we can clean the atmosphere even more. It's not that we haven't, that we haven't had a lot of quite reasonable clean air legislation. The question is that we need more, uh, not less. And we need to be constantly monitoring what the levels of those, uh, of those emissions ought to be. So now let's turn even more directly to Maine. Uh, Maine has a very diverse climate. If you take a look at the, at the slide, uh, you'll see that Maine spans about four degrees of latitude. And it is equivalent in terms of its climate range to about 15 degrees of latitude uh, in Europe basically almost all the way to northern Scandinavia and quite far south uh, into Europe. So we have a very diverse climate. And how does one understand uh, a diverse climate? 
uh, that, and how it's changed over time and how it's changed over space. Uh, we were approached by Governor Baldacci uh, quite a few years ago in 2012 to put together a report for the state. It's been updated several times, but the most recent ones that, that uh, came out were 2019. We put out a report that described the changes in particular in coastal Maine uh, and what was expected for the future. That report provided the basis for our next report. These are from our climate ch the Climate Change Institute, which is Maine's Climate Future, uh, where we covered all of Maine and gave examples about how things, not just the climate, but how the things impacted by climate will change. And I'm very happy to say that those have provided the, uh, been a large portion of the scientific basis uh, for what Governor Mills uh, recently organized in the last few months. And that's the uh, Maine Climate Council. Uh, about 150, the num I don't have the number entirely, uh, researchers, uh, people from the federal government uh, got together and have, uh, are in the process of finalizing a very impressive report, not just about the scientific basis, but also about all of the consequences and how we, in fact, uh, mitigate and adapt uh, to these consequences. We're very fortunate uh, to have a state, although complicated climatically, but nevertheless a state that's taking this so seriously. So what do we learn from these reports? Uh, one of the simple things, uh, many people know this already, uh, in the early part of the 1900s, uh, places like Penobscot Bay, right out our back door here, uh, were frozen part of the winter. And you could actually drive right across uh, from Camden to, to Castine. Uh, and the frequency of those events drops off dramatically uh, once you get into the 1950s, 60s, with only one moderate event in 1971. If you take a look at the temperature change in Maine uh, from 1895 roughly to the present, there's been a three degree Fahrenheit rise in temperature. That may not seem very, like very much, uh, but imagine uh, being in a place uh, with, for example, uh, whether you're, you're standing on a frozen lake, uh, the surface of the frozen lake is at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, all of a sudden the temperature increases one degree, and bang, you'll begin to notice the change very fast. Main precipitation in the same time period has increased on the order of about six inches. In many ways, this is very good for us. Obviously, we have a tremendously forested uh, state, uh, and it's important for us to have sufficient precipitation uh, to keep that forest healthy and the agriculture that goes with it. But now let's take a look at how uh, any one of these temperature events, the upper left is average temperature over Maine, and here is the, what that temperature range, or what the spatial distribution of that temperature looked like in 1904, what the spatial distribution looked like in 1966, and what it looks like, looked like in 2010. Clearly, uh, coastal areas are warming faster. Uh, the whole state is experiencing change, but the coastal regions are experiencing it the fastest. So how do we take what we already know and make predictions for the future? One of the mechanisms is by using climate models. And these climate models are based on trying to understand what the physics of the atmosphere, the physics of the ocean, the physics of glaciers is, putting them all together in models that represent uh, how the changes occur, how glaciers get smaller and bigger, uh, how winds move from one part of the planet to another. Uh, and then you begin to perturb this model uh, by saying, by knowing that as you add CO2, this has been known for well over 100 years, uh, you warm the climate and you begin to see what that effect is in the future. Uh, and that provides you with a global view. And these models are primarily uh, geared towards a global view of how uh, the climate is changing. And if you look on the right side, you'll see what the models suggest. Uh, if we go from 2020, where we are now, you'll see the, um, the red and the blue lines. And off to the right, you'll see things called RCPs. Each RCP assumes a higher level of greenhouse gas emission, and the lowest one assumes some sort of a cutoff in the levels of these emissions. So these are our, this is our basic roadmap. There is no doubt at all that the planet will warm 
and all portions of it will gradually warm more and more. Uh, but this is a rather linear view of how the climate will change. Let's take a look at how well these models do if you run them backwards. So the, uh, the gray line is the, the gray solid line, is the actual change uh, in, in the record. Uh, and sorry, the Sorry, the green line looked different here. The green line is the, are the observations, and the black line is the reconstructed model. The reconstructed model follows fairly well what goes on, but it doesn't show an awful lot of the variability that is extremely important. However, if we look at these models and see what they're telling us from Maine, we see that by 2030 to 2050, Maine's temperature will rise 3 degrees Fahrenheit under sort of a, a mid-level uh, emission model, uh, the very same amount of change that we've experienced since 1900. This is only 10 to 30 uh, years from now. Uh, we find out that, of course, the summers will get longer. We already know this. The growing seasons is at least one week longer than it was several decades ago. And along with those warmer temperatures come increased uh, abundance, unfortunately, of, of ticks. Uh, when we came to Maine from New Hampshire in 2000, we were so excited uh, because there were no ticks in Maine, and obviously that's changed dramatically. And if you look at the projection for 2040 to 49, uh, it changes even more so. These uh, shaded areas are basically showing you the number of days when the temperature is warm enough uh, for ticks to actually begin to, uh, to be happy and to move out. Uh, as it turns out, temperature is directly related to our health in terms of heat stress. Not surprising. What is surprising is that a small change in temperature from 74 to 79 degrees Fahrenheit, not very high, but a big change for Maine, uh, you get the number of people going to hospital literally doubling with that a rise in temperature. And the expectation by the middle of, the, of this century is that the number of days uh, more than 95 degrees Fahrenheit will in fact triple. By uh, 2035 to 2054, it's expected that precipitation will increase another six inches. Uh, and that's exactly the same thing that's happened over the last 125 years. So very, very fast changes. Uh, and this is all based on a relatively linear view with a moderate uh, increase or middle of the road increase, I should say, in CO2, not accounting for this dramatic rise in methane. Let's take a look at uh, how biomes are changing. Uh, obviously, we're going from a boreal, eventually by 2050, into a significantly more broadleaf uh, environment. We all know that the Gulf of Maine is one of the warm uh, fastest warming uh, seas or, or bays in, in the world, certainly parts of the ocean. Uh, we know that lobster mortality increases dramatically when you get above two, two and above 68 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And of course, we know how lobster catches have migrated uh, from Rhode Island, Massachusetts up to Maine, fortunately for us now. But as the temperatures increase, obviously things will change. So that's what the models tell us. And the models are great for seeing the general trend. But if you can add in what are called analogs, some understanding of what really cold days look like in, let's say, the last 100 years when we have measurements of what a really high precipitation days look like, that allows you to look at a more regional to local scale to what's going to happen in the future. It allows you to have some better understanding of what the variability in climate will be. And once you understand that, you can, uh, you can determine what the impacts will be on a variety of things. Here's an example. Uh, blueberries. As it turns out, blueberries uh, tend to like it when the Gulf of Maine sea surface temperatures are high and when there is more rain moving uh, onshore. There'll be more rain as a consequence of which way the winds are blowing, and there'll certainly be more moisture in the atmosphere as the Gulf of Maine warms because warm air holds more moisture. So it's going to be good for blueberries. Uh, as it turns out, when the Pacific Ocean is warmer, which is classically in El Nino, uh, it turns out that Maine uh, tends to be drier and warmer. Uh, and in fact, this has worked quite well for most of the major El Ninos uh, when parts of the Pacific were warmer. Right now, it turns out that we, we're going into a semi-drought. We're not in an El Nino, so the story is a bit more complicated than that. But the important take-home message is the fact that while we're going to have an increase in precipitation, it's not going to happen every single year. 
And if you take a look at this plot without going into detail, the blue is showing you what happens when the, when the Pacific is warmer. It's telling us that, in fact, these parts of the United States tend to be wetter. And you can see the very different color over Maine. That's telling us that Maine gets drier uh, and therefore is not necessarily operating the way the rest of the United States does, which means, again, that you can't just depend on the global models. And then there's another wild card in the system. It's volcanic events. Uh, in 1991-92, we experienced the Pinatubo volcanic eruption, the largest of the last few decades. And during that time, northeastern United States got cooler and drier for one to two years. Uh, these big events occur every few decades. It would not be surprising at all if we experienced one in the next few years. So if we now think about not just sort of a, a linear pathway for uh, climate change, but rather one in which we try to understand more about the variability, one in which the rate of change might be significantly faster, we come up with this generalized view here. Going from 2020 to 2040, we might very well expect that there will be dry periods, although they will be probably relatively rare uh, in time, but they could occur for a year or two, and that's very that could be very effective. They could come as a consequence of major atmospheric circulation changes over the Pacific uh, and volcanic eruptions. We may very well also experience a dramatic change uh, in the rate of climate change as a consequence of methane increasing in the atmosphere from the Arctic. So very quickly, what are the impacts of climate change? Uh, a general category, health and resource depletion. We've already talked about, in some way, pollution, uh, mildly uh, vector-borne diseases, ocean acidification. These are all things that significantly impact our health and they impact our resources. Uh, we drink water, we breathe air. These are all impacted by changes in climate. Our economy is impacted. Uh, we obviously know that in, in Maine, we spend a large portion of our income on energy for both transportation and for heating. Uh, and finding a way in which we can reduce that is potentially very important. And if you can find a way in which it's renewable, even better. Uh, and in the process, you create more jobs. If we take a look at the frequency of catastrophes, extreme events, storm surges, which are the precursor uh, warning to how we will, in decades in the future, uh, see sea level rise impacting us, catastrophes that change the food supply, uh, that create refugees on the order of at least 100 million refugees are, are suggested uh, to be out there in the next two to three to four decades as a consequence of displacement related to climate change. And then geopolitical implications. We have a new ocean. Many different countries uh, are interested in capturing the resources in that ocean, which has its own compounded impacts. Uh, geopolitically, we have had a certain amount of energy independence uh, dependence, if we can become more independent, it's all the better. Uh, water tower countries that no longer have water uh, or the ones that do have water are going to be obviously uh, taken in one way or another by countries that are drier. Uh, climate refugees I already mentioned. And of course, uh, the impacts of climate change uh, tend uh, to be, in general, more severe in the less developed regions. Uh, in particular, in those drier regions, it, regions in which small changes in sea level can be effective uh, and storms. And then finally, now, of course, we have COVID-19. And COVID-19 and climate change have a lot in common. Uh, and uh, let me just briefly run through this. Uh, they both have local uh, to global impacts. Uh, the big difference, of course, is that climate change is a long-term uh, phenomenon not phenomena, it's a long-term forcing uh, that we have engaged. Uh, COVID-19, uh, if it follows the way most pandemics do, and particularly with modern technology, this is something that will be, uh, be short-lived. Uh, both impact human health, quite obviously COVID-19, uh, but as it turns out, climate change has an impact on COVID-19 uh, and its severity. Uh, at the weaker we are in terms of respiratory disease, 
uh, and a variety of other things, the more stressed our immune system is, and therefore we become more and more susceptible to the impacts of COVID-19. Climate change is causing, in some parts of the world, great food insecurity, uh, which of course stresses people, makes them more susceptible uh, to COVID-19. Uh, and at the same time, COVID-19 is, is preventing an awful lot of uh, tilling of the land, uh, uh, taking, uh, uh, providing crops and moving them around. Uh, both require mitigation. In the case of COVID-19, uh, COVID, uh, it's testing, but most importantly, a vaccine. In the case of climate change, it's actually way more complicated. Uh, it requires a lot of different actions uh, and is operating more slowly. It's been with us for a long time, but it operates slowly. And, and if you remember that first map that I showed you, there are parts of the, of the world in which the temperature change is not so big. If I showed you the frequency of storms, changes in precipitation, you would see that some of those areas are actually more impacted by precipitation than temperature change. But it's very hard uh, without actually looking at the information, without having a perspective to understand how, uh, how fast and how, how impactful climate change is. They have both created new norms. I don't need to tell you about COVID-19, obviously, uh, but climate change has created new norms too. We should expect for the future and have already experienced in the last decade significantly higher instabilities in climate than any of us have experienced in any of our lives and, and going back many generations. And they both provide us with perspective. Uh, in the case of COVID-19, part of the perspective, of course, is the fact that we're doing things differently as we are tonight. In the case of COVID-19, we're not uh, able to do many of the things that we've done before. We spend more time at home, and that has various uh, impacts on us from both uh, negative to, to very, very positive. Uh, climate change has created a new perspective too, obviously, because things we depended on, air travel is not necessarily going to happen the way uh, it would before. And because of COVID-19, we have also had our most recent, or our, I shouldn't say our most recent, we have had our first global view of what it would be like to start to shut down the pollution, the greenhouse gases, and a lot of the toxic substances are, that are in the atmosphere. We all know that when you go outside in the evening nowadays, uh, with transportation shut down, industry reduced, uh, that we can see the stars that we, far more clearly than we did before. And we can always see them uh, in much of Maine, but they're even clearer than ever before. Our most previous example, in fact, it impacted just the United States. It was during 9-11. Exactly the same thing happened. When you stop transportation, reduce energy usage, you immediately get a reduction in toxic substance, substances. And in this case, because it's been so long, also greenhouse gases, uh, yet another thing that we were able to demonstrate from the ice cores that clean air legislation works. In this case, the clean air legislation was produced by something we didn't want. So how does Maine, how does Maine figure in, in all of this? There are sadly, uh, uh, places in the world where, in fact, the change in climate is simply going to collapse uh, the society that exists there. We have a lot of water, except potentially during a volcanic event and during rare droughts, we have plenty of water, which is fantastic. We have uh, an immense forest cover, the largest forest cover of any state uh, outside of, uh, in, in the continental U.S. And that forest cover, this is a new uh, finding that's reported in the Maine Climate Council, that forest cover actually captures 75% of the carbon that we emit into the atmosphere. It's phenomenal. It makes us, in many ways, uh, one of the most responsive to cleaning our, our, our air uh, in, in the United States. And then, of course, we have this remarkable coastline and marine uh, access uh, which, of course, we need to manage as carefully as we can, and tremendous amount of effort has gone into that. Uh, we have uh, solar power. Uh, we have a large surface areas uh, in which we can gather more solar power, and we have the capability being tested right in our state offshore of large offshore wind power systems that will, when eventually put in place, be the equivalent of several nuclear power plants. We will become the Saudi Arabia of this part of the world 
and we, are, we will have the opportunity to actually distribute energy to other places rather than having to pay uh, for the energy that we get. This is, this is an immense thing. And an awful lot of that research for making these systems is going on at the University of Maine, my, my good colleague Habib Dagger and his, uh, his team. Uh, with wind and solar power, we can increase dramatically our energy independence. Uh, we will reduce pollution. Uh, and of course, as the Arctic opens up, we know in particular for Portland that Maine is going to be the eastern arc, uh, gateway uh, to travel and transport across the Arctic Ocean uh, from Asia, where until recently we got most of our products. Organic farming is taking off in this state. It's absolutely phenomenal. And if you could supply uh, the relatively low cost energy uh, to these places that we can get and renewable energy from solar and wind, they can do even better. And as a consequence, I believe that through this new energy, through this new farming, uh, through the new awareness of the, of the, of the placement of, uh, of Maine in, in terms of the Arctic, we will have an improved economy and more jobs. What will come along with that, I believe, is an increase, a dramatic increase in population, which is something that we need to prepare for. And we need to prepare for it. Will it happen? No, it won't necessarily happen, but it's very smart for us to plan for a dramatic, I think, a doubling in population in the next few years. And it will have a tremendous impact on our quality of life. And after our relationships with our family, we probably care most about our health, misspelled, sorry, uh, and, our, and our wealth. So what can we do to make all this happen? Uh, number one, you can follow the emerging reports from the Maine Climate Council. Uh, I, I watch the, um, the Zoom sessions uh, for the reporting, and it's quite remarkable. They're looking into literally every aspect of the state that's related to emissions uh, and climate change. Uh, and you can go to our two apps, uh, Climate Reanalyzer, to look at how physical climate is changing on a day-to-day -day basis relative to the whole world and air quality looking at 10 green. We can energize our legislators uh, through contacting them and through voting, and we do absolutely have legislators at the state and federal level uh, in Maine who are well behind this concept of, of changing the way we are dealing with climate change. Support climate-friendly activities, uh, everything from non-governmental organizations to groups that are, are trying to insulate homes and, of, and, and the myriad of ways, uh, places that sell used clothing because we don't necessarily, and used products, we don't necessarily need to buy everything new, and adopt climate-friendly solutions. Increase efficiency, reduce emissions, this is on a personal basis, uh, and reduce our waste and increase reuse. And then finally, insist, I think, and this is what the, uh, the New Green Deal was supposed to do. This is actually what the original uh, New Deal was supposed to do. Provide us with clean air. If we have clean air and clean water, our health costs will go down dramatically and we'll obviously live in a, in a much more comfortable society. And we need to struggle to, uh, not struggle, but we need to continue the r remarkable effort that's going on in this state uh, to preserve our resources, our forests, our marshlands, uh, and our coastline, and the marine areas that we're in contact with. We're very fortunate to have these resources, and they have a lot to do with our economy. So, just to end, I'd like to leave you with an idea. The age of climate decision is here, and our actions will define the course of civilization and the health of our planet. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Paul, for such an exciting and informative talk. And please join us for our next webinar on July 22nd with coral reef scientist Dr. Nancy Nelson, our ocean planet in three acts, staggering diversity, scary news, and reasons for hope.